Tuesday, January 5th, and today we're going to be reading Liber Eba, Chapter 1, Asana. First, we're going to read the first lecture, first principles of eight lectures on yoga by Mahatma Guru Sri Paramahamsa Shivaji. Alistair's title is Yogi. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It is my will to explain the subject of yoga in clear language, without resort to jargon or the enunciation of fantastic hypotheses, in order that this great science may be thoroughly understood as of universal importance. For like all great things, it is simple, but, like all great things, it is masked by confused thinking, and only too often brought into contempt by the machinations of knavery. There is more nonsense talked and written about yoga than about anything else in the world. Most of this nonsense, which is fostered by charlatans, is based upon the idea that there is something mysterious and oriental about it. There isn't. Do not look to me for obelisks and odalisks, rahat lakum, bulbuls, or any other tinsel imagery of the yoga mongers. I am neat but not gaudy. There is nothing mysterious or oriental about anything, as everybody knows who has spent a little time intelligently in the continents of Asia and Africa. I propose to invoke the most remote and elusive of all gods to throw clear light upon the subject, the light of common sense. All phenomena of which we are aware take place in our own minds, and therefore the only thing we have to look at is the mind, which is a more constant quantity over all the species of humanity than is generally supposed. What appear to be radical differences, irreconcilable by argument, are usually found to be due to the obstinate obstinacy of habit produced by the generations of systematic sectarian th training. We must then begin the study of yoga by looking at the meaning of the word. It means union, from the same Sanskrit root as the Greek word zudma, the Latin word jugum, and the English word yoke, yug to join. When a dancing girl is dedicated to the service of a temple, there is a yoga of her relations to celebrate. Yoga, in short, may be translated tea fight, which doubtless accounts for the fact that all students of yoga in England do nothing but gossip over endless libations of lions. Yoga means union. In what sense are we to consider this? How is the word yoga to imply a system of religious training or a description of religious experience? You may note, incidentally, that the word religion is really identifiable with yoga. It means binding together. Yoga means union. What are the elements which are united or to be united when this word is used in its common sense of a practice widely spread in Hindustan whose object is the emancipation of the individual who studies and practices it from the less pleasing features of his life on this planet? I say Hindustan, but I really mean anywhere on the earth, for research has shown that similar methods producing similar results are to be found in every country. The details vary, but the general structure is the same, because all bodies and so all minds have identical forms. Yoga means union. In the mind of a pious person, the inferiority complex which accounts for his piety compels him to interpret this emancipation as union with the gaseous vertebrate whom he has invented and called God. On the cloudy vapor of his fears, his imagination has thrown a vast, distorted shadow of himself, and he is duly terrified and the more he cringes before it, the more the specter seems to stoop to crush him. People with these ideas will never get to anywhere but lunatic asylums and churches. It is because of this overwhelming miasma of fear that the whole subject of yoga has become obscured. A perfectly simple problem has been complicated by the most abject ethical and superstitious nonsense, yet all the time the truth is patent in the word itself. Yoga means union. We may now consider what yoga really is. Let us go for a moment into the nature of consciousness with the tail of an eye on such sciences as mathematics, biology, and chemistry. In mathematics, the expression A plus B plus C is a triviality. Write A plus B plus C equals O, or zero, and you obtain an equation from which the most glorious truths may be developed. In biology, the cell divides endlessly, but never becomes anything different. But if we unite cells of opposite qualities, male and female, we lay the foundations of a structure whose summit is unattainably fixed in the heavens of imagination. Similar facts occur in chemistry. The atom by itself has few constant qualities, none of them particularly significant, but as soon as an element combines with the object of its hunger, we get not only the ecstatic production of light, heat, and so forth, but a more complex structure having few or none of the qualities of its elements, 
but capable of, capable of further combination into complexities of astonishing sublimity. All these combinations, these unions, are yoga. Yoga means union. How are we to apply this word to the phenomena of mind? What is the first characteristic of everything in thought? How did it come to be a thought at all? Only by making a distinction between it and the rest of the world. The first proposition, the type of all propositions, is S is P. There must be two different things whose relation forms knowledge. Yoga is first of all the union of the subject and the object of consciousness, of the seer with the thing seen. Now there is nothing strange or wonderful about all this. The study of the principles of yoga is very useful to the average man, if only to make him think about the nature of the world as he supposes that he knows it. Let us consider a piece of cheese. We say that this has certain qualities, shape, structure, color, solidity, weight, taste, smell, consistency, and the rest, but investigation has shown that this is all illusory. Where are these qualities? Not in the cheese, for different observers give quite different accounts of it. Not in ourselves, for we do not perceive them in the absence of the cheese. All material things, all impressions, are phantoms. In reality, the cheese is nothing but a series of electric charges. Even the most fundamental quality of all, mass, has been found not to exist. The same is true of the matter in our brains, which is partly responsible for these perceptions. What then of these qualities of which we are all so sure? They would not exist without our brains. They would not exist without the cheese. They are the results of the union, that is, of the yoga, of the seer and the seen, of subject and object and consciousness, as the philosophical phrase goes. They have no material existence. They are only names given to the ecstatic results of this particular form of yoga. I think that nothing can be more helpful to the student of yoga than to get the above proposition firmly established in his subconscious mind. About nine-tenths of the trouble in understanding the subject is all this ballyhoo about yoga being mysterious and oriental. The principles of yoga and the spiritual results of yoga are demonstrated in every conscious and unconscious happening. This is that which is written in the book of the law. Love is the law, love under will. For love is the instinct to unite and the act of uniting. But this cannot be done indiscriminately. It must be done under will. That is, in accordance with the nature of the particular units concerned. Hydrogen has no love for hydrogen. It is not the nature or the true will of hydrogen to seek to unite with a molecule of its own kind. Add hydrogen to hydrogen, nothing happens to its quality. It is only the quantity that changes. It rather seeks to enlarge its experience of the possibilities by union with atoms of opposite character, such as oxygen. With this it combines, with an explosion of light, heat, and sound, to form water. The result is entirely different from either of the component elements and has another kind of true will, such as to unite with, dissimilar, with similar disengagement of light and heat with potassium, while the resulting caustic potash has in its turn a totally new series of qualities with still another true will of its own, that is, to unite explosively with acids and so on. It may, seem to you, uh, it may seem to some of you that these explanations have rather knocked the bottom out of yoga, that I've reduced it to the ca category of common things. That was my object. There's no sense in being frightened of yoga, awed by yoga, muddled and mystified by yoga, or enthusiastic over yoga. If we are to make any progress in its study, we need clear heads and the impersonal scientific attitude. It is, as, as, it is especially important not to bedevil ourselves with oriental jargon. We may have to use a few Sanskrit words, but that is only because they have no English equivalents. And any attempt to translate them burdens us with the connotations of the existing English words which we employ. However, these words are very few, and if the definitions which I propose to give you are carefully studied, they should present no difficulty. Having now understood that yoga is the essence of all phenomena whatsoever, we may ask what is the special meaning of the word in respect of our proposed investigation, since the process of the results are familiar to every one of us, so familiar indeed that there is actually nothing else at all of which we may have any knowledge. It is knowledge. What is it we are going to study, and why should we study it? The answer is very simple. All this yoga that we know and practice, this yoga that produced these ecstatic results that we call phenomena, includes among its spiritual emanations a good deal of unpleasantness. The more we study this universe produced by our yoga, the more we collect and synthesize our experience. 
the nearer we get to a perception of what the Buddha declared to be characteristic of all component things. Sorrow, change, and absence of any permanent principle. We, we constantly approach this enunciation of the first two noble truths as he called them. Everything is sorrow, and the cause of sorrow is desire. By the word desire, he meant exactly what is meant by love in the Book of the Law, which I quoted a few moments ago. Desire is the need of every unit to extend its experience by combi combining with its opposite. It is easy enough to construct the whole series of arguments which lead up to the first noble truth. Every operation of love is the satisfaction of a bitter hunger, but the appetite only grows fiercer by satisfaction, so that we can say with the preacher, he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The root of all this sorrow is in the sense of insufficiency. The need to unite, to lose oneself in the beloved ob object, is the manifest proof of this fact, and it is clear also that the satisfaction produces only a temporary relief, because the process expands indefinitely. The thirst increases with the drinking. The only complete satisfaction conceivable would be the yoga of the atom with the entire universe. This fact is easily perceived and has been constantly expressed in the mystical philosophies of the West. The only goal is union with God. Of course, we only use the word God because we have been brought up in superstition, and the higher philosophies, both, both in the East and in the West, have preferred to speak of union with the All or the Absolute. More superstitions. Very well, then, there is no difficulty at all, since every thought in our being, every cell in our bodies, every electron and proton of our atoms is nothing but yoga, and the result of yoga. All we have to do to obtain emancipation, satisfaction, everything we want, is to perform this universal and inevitable operation upon the Absolute itself. Some of the more sophisticated members of my audience may possibly be thinking that there is a catch in it somewhere. They are perfectly right. The snag is simply this. Every element of which we are composed is indeed constantly occupied in the satisfaction of its particular needs by its own particular yoga. But for that very reason, it is completely obsessed by its own function, which it must naturally consider as the be-all and end-all of its existence. For instance, if you take a glass tube, open at both ends, and put it over a bee on the window pane, it will continue beating against the window to the point of exhaustion and death instead of escaping through the tube. We must not confuse the necessary automatic functioning of any of our elements with the true will, which is the proper orbit of any star. A human being only acts as a unit at all because of countless generations of training. Evolutionary processes have set up a higher order of yogic action by which we have managed to subordinate what we call particular interests to what we consider the general welfare. We are communities, and our well-being depends upon the wisdom of our councils and the discipline with which their decisions are enforced. The more complicated we are, the higher we are in the scale of evolution, the more complex and difficult is the task of legislation and of maintaining order. In highly civilized communities like our own, <laughs> the individual is constantly being attacked by conflicting interests and necessities. His individuality is constantly being assailed by the impact of other people, and in a very large number of cases, he is unable to stand up to the strain. Schizophrenia, which is a lovely word and may or may not be found in your dictionary, is an exceedingly common complaint. It means the splitting up of the mind. In extreme cases, we get the phenomena of multiple personality. Jekyll and Hyde, only more so. At the best, when a man says I, he refers only to a transitory phenomenon. His I changes as he utters the word. But philosophy apart, it is rarer and rarer to find a man with a mind of his own and a will of his own, even in the modified sense. I want you, therefore, to see the nature of the obstacles to union with the Absolute. For one thing, the yoga which we constantly practice has not invariable results. There is a question of attention, of investigation, of reflection. I propose to deal in a future instruction with the modifications of our perception thus caused, for they are of great importance to our science of yoga. For example, the classical case of the two lost men lost in a thick wood at night. One says to the other, that dog barking is not a grasshopper, it is the creaking of a cart. Or again, he thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from a bus. He looked again and saw it was a hippopotamus. Everyone who has done any scientific investigation knows painfully how every observation must be corrected again and again. The need of yoga is so bitter that it blinds us. We are constantly tempted to see and hear what we want to see and hear. 
It is therefore incumbent upon us, if we wish to make the universal and final yoga with the absolute, to master every element of our being, to protect it against all civil and external war, to intensify every faculty to the utmost, to train ourselves in knowledge and power to the utmost, so that at the proper moment we may be in perfect condition to fling ourselves up into the furnace of ecstasy which flames from the abyss of annihilation. Love is the law, love under will. Chapter 1. Asana The problem before us may be stated thus simply. A man wishes to control his mind, to be able to think one chosen thought for as long as he will without interruption. As previously remarked, the first difficulty arises from the body, which keeps on asserting its presence by causing its victim to itch and in other ways be distracted. He wants to search, scratch, sneeze. This nuisance is so persistent that the Hindus, in their scientific way, devised a special practice for quieting it. The word asana means posture, but as with all words which have caused debate, its exact meaning has altered and it is used in several distinct senses by various authors. The greatest authority on yoga is Patanjali. He says asana is that which is firm and pleasant. This may be taken as meaning the result of success in the practice. Again, Samkhya says posture is that which is steady and easy. And again, any posture which is steady and easy is an asana. There is no other rule. Any posture will do. In a sense, this is true because any posture becomes uncomfortable sooner or later. The steadiness and easiness mark a definite attainment as will be explained later on. Hindu books such as the Siva Samhita give countless postures, many, perhaps most of them, impossible for the average adult European. Others insist that the head, neck, and spine should be kept vertical and straight for reasons connected with the subject of prana, which will be dealt with in its proper place. The positions illustrated in Liber E form the best guide. The extreme of asana is practiced by those yogins who remain in one position without moving except in the case of absolute necessity during their whole lives. One should not criticize such persons without a thorough knowledge of the subject. Such knowledge has not yet been published. However, one may safely assert that since the great men previously mentioned did not do this, it will not be necessary for their followers. Let us then choose a suitable position and consider what happens. There is a sort of happy medium between rigidity and limpness. The muscles are not to be strained, and yet they are not to be altogether slack. It is difficult to find a good descriptive word. Braced is perhaps the best. A sense of physical alertness is desirable. Think of the tighter about to spring, or of the oarsman waiting for the gun. After a little, there will be cramp and fatigue. The student must now set his teeth and go through with it. The minor sensations of itching, etc., will be found to pass away if they are resolutely neglected, but the cramp and fatigue may be expected to increase until the end of its practice. One may begin with half an hour or an hour. The student must not mind if the process of quitting the asana involves several minutes of the acutest agony. It will require a good deal of determination to persist day after day, for in most cases it will be found that the discomfort and pain, instead of diminishing, tend to increase. On the other hand, if the student pay no attention, fail to watch the body, an opposite phenomenon may occur. He shifts his ease without knowing that he has done so. To avoid this, choose a position which naturally is rather cramped and awkward, in which slight changes are not sufficient to bring ease. Otherwise, for the first few days, the student may even imagine that he has conquered the position. In fact, in all these practices, their apparent simplicity is such that the beginner is likely to wonder what all the fuss is about, perhaps to think that he is specially gifted. Similarly, a man who has never touched a golf club will take his umbrella and carelessly hole a putt, which would frighten the best putter alive. In a few days, however, in all cases, the discomforts will begin. As you go on, they will begin earlier in the course of the hour's exercise. The disinclination to practice at all may become almost unconquerable, but one must warn the student against imagining that some other position would be easier to master than the one he has selected. Once you begin to change about, you are lost. Perhaps the reward is not so far distant. It will happen one day that the pain is suddenly forgotten, the fact of the presence of the body is forgotten, and one will realize that during the whole of one's previous life, the body was always on the borderland of consciousness, and that consciousness, a consciousness of pain. And at this moment, one will further realize with an indescribable feeling of relief that not only is this position which has been so painful the very ideal of physical comfort, but that all other conceivable positions of the body are uncomfortable. This feeling represents success. There will be no further difficulty in the practice. 
One will get into one's asana with almost the same feeling as that with which a tired man gets into a hot bath. And while he is in that position, the body may be trusted to send him no message that might disturb his mind. Other results of this practice are described by Hindu authors, but they do not concern us at the present. Our first obstacle has been removed and we can continue with the others.